So first of all, uh, Vice President, Commissioner Jourova, thank you very much for being prepared uh, to join uh, the Euro Disinfo Lab uh, conference this year. Obviously, we're sorry that it won't be more in person or at the same time, but it's still wonderful that we have this opportunity to speak. Obviously, I had the chance to know you previously when you were Commissioner for Justice and Consumer Affairs, and now you have this exciting new mandate to deal with values and democracy. And of course, at uh, EU Disinfo Lab, we are particularly concerned uh, with what is happening across Europe in terms of the possible um, use of disinformation in elections, the threat uh, to our democracies. So I would invite you to perhaps tell us a bit about what um, you are doing, uh, and then we'll move to some questions. Thank you. Uh, dear Diana, dear friends, colleagues, uh, partners, I am happy to be here with you and to have uh, at least through the digital technologies the chance to uh, add a few words to uh, the big, really big topic, which is called protecting European democracy. It's not the, the last or f first and last time. I, I, I guess uh, we have some uh, concrete cooperation with, with uh, uh, the organization of this info lab. So uh, for, for the moment, uh, I'm grateful for uh, having the, the chance to say a few words about uh, democracy. And maybe next week, next time we will speak about other other uh, uh, hot topics uh, of, of present time. So uh, what to say on protecting European democracy? Democracy. Well, defending our democracy is not just about securing the right to vote. It is also about the rule of law uh, with its concept of checks and balances of independent courts, independent and pluralistic media, the protection of fundamental rights and the defense of certain standards for political debate, campaigning and also organization of elections. When one or several of these elements start to deteriorate, it creates cracks in our democratic foundation. And such weaknesses can be exploited by malign actors, both foreign and domestic. The COVID-19 pandemic has yet again demonstrated the importance of the resilience of our democratic institutions. We saw the emergence of limitations of our freedoms, but we also saw national courts applying checks and balances and deciding on the proportionality of such measures. Deliberation and debate, instruments to hold decision makers to account, strengthens public buy-in and promotes a more coherent whole society approach even in times of crisis situations such as the COVID-19. Fair democratic debates and electoral campaigns as well as free and fair elections in all member states are at the core of our democracies. You might know that in June we published a report on the 2019 European elections which sets out key lessons learned and potential follow-up measures. The report assessed that these were the most digital elections. A large proportion of EU citizens use the Internet and online sources and social media play an increased role in our democratic debate, giving political actors unprecedented opportunities to get their messages across and even greater access to in debate for citizens. While new technologies make it easier for politicians and citizens to interact and contribute to the debate, they have also brought along new challenges. Citizens' access to media and news information has changed. Messages, including false information, can be disseminated and amplified much easier. It is easier to misinform and manipulate people at an unprecedented scale. Dangerous messages, 
misleading health care information and organized propaganda campaigns are also being used to take advantage of the COVID-19 crisis to sow division, instill fear, exploit citizens and even put their lives at risk. They undermine trust in the EU and its member states and attack our basic values. As shown in our recent communication tackling COVID-19 disinformation, getting the facts right, all Commission departments and European External Action Service are taking part in the common effort to combat the virus. This includes the response to disinformation and other efforts to exploit the crisis, to help protect democracies in the EU and ensure that our citizens' confidence and trust in our institutions is preserved. The Code of Practice on Disinformation has proven a very valuable instrument in this fight by providing a framework for a structured dialogue between relevant stakeholders, the first one of its kind worldwide, to ensure greater transparency and greater accountability. However, the assessment of the Code of Practice on Disinformation highlights that in order to ensure a complete and consistent application across platforms and member states, the code should be further improved in several areas by providing commonly shared definitions, clearer procedures, more precise commitments, as well as transparent key performance indicators and appropriate monitoring. Participation should be broadened to include other relevant stakeholders, in particular from the advertising sector. Building on these lessons learned, the Commission will put forward a European Democracy Action Plan later this year. It will draw from the Commission's 2019 elections report published and the continuous input from the European Cooperation Network on Elections, which met just last week to discuss electoral integrity and exchange best practices during the COVID-19 pandemic. The European Democracy Action Plan will respond to this crisis in the European way, in full respect to our fundamental principles and values as set out in the treaties. It is essential to keep a balanced approach fully respecting democratic checks and balances and involving all the concerned entities, such as media, civil society organizations, platforms, and also citizens themselves. And also ensuring the protection of fundamental rights, in particular freedom of expression. I will make sure the action plan will have a particular focus on citizens' active participation and the role of civil society as watchdog. I know very well, people like you are also essential in combating disinformation on the ground, in investigating manipulations, in fact-checking and media literacy, and at helping strengthen cooperation amongst diverse actors of the civil society at European level. Europe is uniquely well-placed to lead the world in championing democracy in the digital age and developing the regulatory framework to help make that happen. So, thank you for being part of the discussion and important actors in this exercise. But thank you anyway. Let, let's try some, some questions. That gives us a very good overview of, of where we've come from, where we are. Perhaps I can uh, try to take it to the, to the next step. You referred to the um, European Democracy Action Plan, which you've obviously been consulting on very widely. And you, as you say, you hope to come forward, or you will come forward with, with the action plan in the next few months. In terms of the consultations that, that you've conducted, fr from your perspective, what, what do you think are the sort of main takeaways from the mm. consultations? Yes, first of all, uh, I, I like the consultation process because we 
cannot be alone <laughs> is the topic. This is too serious, too important to draft something from the Brussels office. And uh, uh, in spite of the fact that we already uh, consulted a lot with the platforms, with the member states, with the research and academics, uh, uh, with the, the important NGOs, uh, well, uh, we uh, still relied a lot on the consultation process. And uh, I am delighted uh, to hear from my colleagues that we have received about 350 replies. Uh, and out of these, uh, about 200 replies come from EU citizens, while some 150 answers come from stakeholders, such as civil society organizations, research institutions, and uh, the private sector from across Europe. Uh, strengthening our democratic processes from within and rendering them more resilient can only be achieved through a whole of society approach in a coordinated effort of governments, civil society researchers and fact checkers and private sector. So the, consult the consultation only closed last week. We have just had a brainstorming about what we will include in the European Democracy Action Plan. Uh, but we, we use uh, uh, in full the, the conclusions of, of the consultation process. Uh, uh, th there will be three chapters. Uh, one, uh, and I, I forgot, I, I skipped the main purpose of, of ADAP, if I can use the abbreviation. It's uh, the protection of democracy through protection of elections. And when you look at how we can guarantee free and fair elections, there are several necessary things, and we want to cover most of them in ADAP. One is to have uh, a level playing field and fair political campaigning. So political campaigning, which will uh, take on board that uh, most of the political campaigning is now ongoing online, which is heavily unregulated space. So, political campaign which will be very clear as for financing, as for transparency, who pays, uh, what purpose, uh, political campaigning which will be about real people and real visions, and not about uh, who has better uh, technologies and, uh, and artificial intelligence <laughs> possibilities, and who has uh, dirty money and, and uh, dirty methods like using disinformation in the campaign. Yeah, so uh, a lot is on this vehicle. Uh, in ADAP, uh, at the beginning of, of December, we will uh, announce the legislation for the next year, which will cover this issue of political campaigning. The Commission can only regulate political campaigning for the European political parties and European elections. But at the same time, we want to uh, deliver the recommendation of the same thing to happen at national level. We cannot do otherwise because we don't have competence for, for the national level. For good reason, I am not complaining. <laughs> but that's why I, I said that we have just met the, the national partners and, and, and colleagues who work in the field of elections because we are coordinating with them also uh, preparation of the legislation uh, for, the, for the campaigning. Uh, so it was one thing. The second uh, chapter in ADAP will be purely about disinformation, not only in relation to political campaigning. So it will be broader. Uh, I can only uh, already now reveal that uh, you can expect that we will have light touch, no censoring, no removing of any content, just a better definition of uh, what disinformation is, disinformation which requires active action. Uh, we will promote the idea of, of uh, fact-checking, of uh, uh, more space for uh, professional journalists to supported by, by the contributions uh, of trustworthy uh, content and uh, we uh, will uh, look also into the very painful issue and it's the micro-targeting. 
because micro targeting which is used in the platforms to sell the products like shoes or vacuum cleaners to consumers fair enough it's business it sells well yeah when that is that is the the uh, access to data uh, of people who gave consent according to gdpr but uh, uh, this data uh, can be used if, if the people gave consent for marketing uh, marketing uh, purpose but for political marketing to use the same method uh, for selling the politicians to citizens it's another another story <laughs> and i received in the past a very useful lesson because i worked in the world of consumers policy I will work till the end of my life to make consumers happy. <laughs> but, but I need to do more to make citizens, if not happy, then well informed, having free choice, uh, not being manipulated, not be, being grouped in some kind of crowd which is easy to manipulate. You understand what's, what's behind that. Now, the third chapter will be in ADAP will be focused on the freedom of speech and, and uh, independent journalism and pluralism in, in media. A plenty of work has to be done here. Uh, the action plan will contain the hooks to budget because we want to support the, the world of journalism also by some financial means, but also uh, ADAP will announce uh, the uh, measures to ensure safety of, of journalists uh, and to address the issue of strategic lawsuit uh, against public participation. Uh, because more and more we, we see that the, the lawsuits uh, the, ab the abusive litigations have its power to silence the journalists. Uh, after Daphne Caruana Galizia, the Maltese journalist, was murdered, uh, her family had to tackle with, I think, 50 litigations, some of them still up and running, mainly in the United Kingdom, which is very costly which is uh, very uh, demanding, which has its deterrence effect, which could cause some self-censorship for the journalists. And we don't like to continue this, this practice when suddenly you see that justice and justice system is abused against the freedom of speech. When you realize what we speak about. So, Sorry, I speak long, but uh, I want to explain uh, the, the, the focus of ADAP. And ADAP will be the twin of Digital Services Act, where we can uh, uh, expect uh, the hard legislation, which will increase the responsibility of the platforms for illegal content. Uh, there will be some, uh, some uh, uh, oversight architecture. So, so uh, we, we want to do this right. Uh, I always say that uh, Margaret Vestager and Thierry Breton, who work on the Digital Services Act, they can come as heavyweight regulators. But I am working on disinformation which is not illegal content, which is harmful, but not necessarily illegal content. So I always say I have to wear white gloves <laughs> and li light touch. <laughs> That's really interesting because th there are two more questions that I have, but th the first one is important and, and, and you've alluded to it already. Obviously, one of the, the concerns is y you mentioned a lot of very good things that, that hopefully will Will, will come out in the action plan. But many of these things in terms of journalism, which has suffered itself during the COVID crisis as well, um, in keeping a plurality of independent media. But not only that, those people that engage in research um, and fact checking in this area, they need, to put it bluntly, they need financial support. If, if, if they are to, to carry on 
and do the job that, that you want them to do in tandem uh, with, with your efforts at a, a legislative level. You sort of hinted that there would be some financial support. I, I don't know if you're, you're able to, 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 to give any more sort of this is this is uh, indeed about the real support, uh, real financial support, which is heavily needed, especially now. Uh, COVID nineteen is ugly, ugly experience and ugly threat in in all thinkable ways. One of the features is that what was a problem before, it's much bigger problem now. And before, we already had a problem of underfinanced independence and independent media because the, the money of advertisers is more and more shifting to Google and other, other players. I think now it's more than 70% of the, of the money of advertisers, which end up in, in, in big, big tech uh, or big, big players' uh, 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 systems. So, so uh, the, the current business model goes against the traditional outlets and uh, the, the independent media, which uh, operate also at regional and local level. Uh, and uh, so we uh, are doing two things. Uh, uh, we are financing, uh, I think, seven or eight projects. Uh, there is, there is not much money, but uh, I speak about millions of euros, uh, which uh, are now working as uh, as the uh, emergency uh, help. So, so the projects uh, are read or held by by the media roof or several media roof organizations. Uh, are uh, supporting the, the journalists by providing legal aid or paying legal aid. They are uh, financing some uh, cross-border uh, investigations, so, so, so the cro cross-border teams. Uh, and they are also now, now financing several shelters, which should provide more, more safety to the journalists who are under the threats, because it's another ugly chapter we live through now, yeah, that the journalists are under under big, big threat, especially the women. Women uh, journalists are under under big, uh, big uh, uh, pressure from uh, from different sides, especially through the social social media threats and, and blackmailing. And uh, this is, of course, uh, something which has to be, first of all, tackled by the law enforcement bodies in the member states. Uh, both Caruana Galicia and Jan Kuciak uh, announced to the police that they suffer from, from the threats. And you see how it ended up. So, so that, that's, that these are the, the, current, the currently funded projects. Then the, um, the uh, current uh, re, uh, emergency money from the current budget uh, which we provided the member states for their state aid schemes. We recommended very clearly the member states that they should cover media sector as any other economic sector. Several member states have done it, yeah, but we, we cannot order that. And for the next budget, to put it, uh, put it uh, already, uh, 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 already briefly, uh, we foresee 61 million euro for, for the media support which we plan again to pay through the organizations because we can hardly uh, finance concrete outlets. Uh, yeah, you know, we, we have to uh, bear in mind that they are mar market players and they should, should keep independence. But connected with the money, there is a very bad tendency that in some member states, the state advertising money is only paid to some outlets which are pro-governmentally, uh, government-friendly uh, outlets, and uh, it is uh, not a good, good signal because this is the connection of of economic and political pressure through one channel. One last question, really, and this goes to the experience with the code and legislative method, the code on disinformation. Um, the code was obviously self-regulatory. Um, you've said you don't have as much power as your colleagues in the internal market area, 
but can we assume that we are moving away from the self-regulatory approach? Uh, I didn't say I don't have uh, uh, comparable power. I, uh, of course, I have enough power. <laughs> but the art, the, the art is to use the power in a, in a smart and proportionate way, especially when you are in the role of a legislator. And I said that for, for the world of political advertising and disinformation, I, I, I need to have much lighter touch because this is, this is the no, domain of Free, free speech and uh, so that's why you can also see this carefulness in the code of practice itself indeed it's self-regulatory uh, it's a kind of gentleman agreement with several big uh, big platforms uh, uh, we uh, are going to continue uh, the improved code of practice and at the same time, we will take some elements from the code of practice and, and uh, place them in the Digital Services Act. Simply the things which need uh, absolute legal certainty, what we want, uh, we, we have to place them to the legislation. I, I will not reveal now which elements because it will now go to the internal discussion and uh, I can only indicate that my, my view is that there should be the things uh, relating to reporting and, and uh, in the, the data p provided to, to the researchers and the, these kind of things. The, 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 in fact, the matters uh, connected with the need to, to have more transparency, more accountability. Uh, and uh, as you know, the Digital Services Act is a legislation which uh, is, is uh, uh, um, uh, which needs uh, to go through a very uh, lengthy legislative process and then the implementation uh, uh, period. So, so uh, it, in ideal situation, in, in my, it might might come into force 2023 or 24, and we need to have something solid before and that's something solid in my view is the code of practice is the continuation of the current uh, cooperation with the platforms and uh, i think that uh, in the, uh, before we we have this uh, this digital services act in force we simply have to rely on the gentleman agreements Uh, uh, we can do only what we can do according to the treaty. So either you you have the ambition to have a legislation and it takes time, and I I foresee that it that the, the legislative process for the the matters relating to the content and and digital uh, uh, development will not be easy, in, especially in the parliament because it's, it's also a concept of liberal conservative view. I already see <laughs> and hear the, the opinions. One last thing, uh, we have to do much more to not, not to fight against the lies and, and misinformation, but to do more to, to achieve that the people will not believe so easy, <laughs> easily. So. Critical thinking, education. We have just adopted the, the digital edu education plan. There is a very big chapter on how to how to include uh, the uh, the education uh, of uh, the the uh, capability to sort out information and not to believe everything. We have included that into this plan, and again, it will be accompanied by by the funding because. It's, it's, it's one of the recommended uh, uh, things uh, for the recovery fund, this, this education and this increasing resilience of the society. We, we have to work on, on many different machines, <laughs> but go in the same direction. <laughs> thank you so much. It's wonderful to see you again. And thank you for giving your time to Euro Disinfo Lab. It's thank you very much, Madame Wallis. And good luck with the heavy legislative agenda. Thank you. I wish good luck to Europe uh, with our legislative agenda, that we will do it right. <laughs> Thank you very much. Have a good day.